Hello, welcome everybody. We're glad you're joining us on Wisdom from Our Neighborhood tonight on May 5th, 2020. Uh, my name is Terry Kylo. I'm the Executive Director of Paths to Understanding, which is formerly Neighbors in Faith and the Tracy Levine Center. Our mission is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking. And tonight I've got two good friends uh, on with me in for conversation. Uh, first is uh, someone that Anil and I met in Wilmer, Minnesota, uh, and a long car ride from, from Minneapolis, from Minneapolis uh, to Wilmer. Rabbi Elena Suskin is an educator, an activist, and writer. She's the editor of the progressive blog, JewSchool.com. She served as assistant rabbi at Addis Israel in Washington, D.C. She reaches across faith traditions to fight Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. And along with Hamza Khan, who was going to join us but has a, a, some family matters to attend to, um, is uh, beginning the Pomegranate Institute. And we'll have some time for her to talk about that. And of course, Anila Afzali, who's the founder of MAPS Amen, the American Muslim Empowerment Network of the Muslim Association of Puget Sound, an activist, a public leader, a friend of mine, a member of the board of the Faith Action Network, an all around excellent human being. So thank you, Anila, for coming and joining us. Thank you for having me. Always excited to be in conversation with you and our, our friend, uh, Rabbi Alana, as well. So, you know, so the, the, the last six weeks we've been doing these shows, we've started off each one talking about how we're doing, uh, just to kind of let people know who are watching or listening that, that, you know, what the process that they're going through to respond to uh, COVID-19 and all of this is something we're going through too. So, Alana, how are you doing uh, with, with all this? You know, it's a, it's a sort of a weirdly normal and equally crazy time at once. Um, in a certain sense, you know, it's just a lot of the same things, only it's on a computer, <laughs> right? The same kind of outreach that we would normally be doing, the same um, talking between different faith groups, like that work continues. It has to continue all the time. And actually in some ways, even more needed now, maybe that, you know, these divisions seem to be, if not growing, at least sharpening. Like when we see all of the, all of the things out there in the world in the different regions of the country, so the work continues. Anila, how about you? Well, I have to say that it's Ramadan now, so things are definitely different, even within this, you know, abnormal time of COVID-19. Uh, but I was so looking forward to Ramadan. I felt like I needed Ramadan. And I have to say, I'm like a little kid during Christmas with the gifts, like with Ramadan. So I was excited to welcome Ramadan, and I'm so glad it's here, uh, because it has definitely given me a spiritual boost, a moral boost, uh, an emotional boost, a mental boost, which is, and even a physical boost, which has all helped me because I was struggling in certain ways with the, uh, you know, abnormal situation, the, these unprecedented, unprecedented times that we're living in. So Ramadan has definitely lifted me up in a lot of positive ways. So I'm grateful for that. But it also brings its own unique challenges in this time of COVID-19, uh, because we don't have the aspect of community and going together and worshiping in the mosque as we've done in prior years. So there's a lot of hard heartbreak with sort of what we're missing out on, but really trying to focus on the relationship with God directly and figure out balance, which I've always struggled with, but certainly at a time like Ramadan, uh, you know, my whole schedule uh, gets thrown out. Uh, and especially as, as Rabbi Alana said, we still have to move forward with the work and there's still a lot of work that is happening. So it's a bit of a struggle, but it's a beautiful struggle, uh, especially with it being Ramadan. Yeah, you know, I, I just, uh, last week, um, as I sort of indicated in last week's show, um, I was experiencing some adaptation fatigue. Mm. And uh, I, I realized uh, when I woke up, uh, you know, Wednesday morning that I just like wasn't going to be able to work very, very much that day. Mm -hmm. And I did do some work, but I, I realized that everything that we're doing, we're trying to do all the same normal, same stuff, but we have to do it through all this technology and, and try to find these other ways to accomplish the same mission. And mm -hmm. so I ended up taking a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday off nice. and uh, did some projects around the house and sort of you know, tried to sleep a bit more, make sure I was all nice and steady with that. And so I do feel better this week, but I think all of us uh, need to be uh, aware of like that deep kind of energy level. And I, and I was thinking, Anila, too, about, about Ramadan, you know, for you, which is that in the midst of this weird time, um, we're also engaged in the life cycles of our wisdom traditions. Mm -hmm. And how, and how in many respects, that's, that's, that's refreshing. It gives us 
a way to structure some of this time, which seems kind of, you know, weirdly frenetic and unstructured at the same, in the same moment. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, uh, Terry, that that's the case, that it, frenetic is the best word to describe it in a lot of ways, because it does feel that way. Uh, at the same time, uh, at least I find, and I know Muslims across the world uh, during this time of Ramadan, find that sense of peace that also comes with our faith practice, uh, that, uh, you know, that that really gives us some of the strength and resilience to be able to make it through this and also make sense of everything and put things in perspective in perspective uh, and really understand sort of purpose a little bit better uh, and have a deeper reason for doing what we're doing. So in all of those ways, it has absolutely helped me. Uh, and I know for my extended, you know, my, my direct family and extended family, uh, uh, it's, it's flying by. Like, I can't believe we're almost halfway through the month of Ramadan already. I know right now that I'm going to miss Ramadan. I'm likely going to cry because Ramadan is over uh, once it's over. So that's something that uh, I'm, I'm not looking forward to, uh, but trying to make the most of each day. Uh, and it is a challenge because you will have days, as you described, Terry, that I also have experienced where it's like, you just hit, you just hit, a, you know, you hit your capacity. You're like, I can't do anymore. I need to take a break. I need to get away from all of this for a moment. Uh, and uh, hopefully we all can find the opportunity to get away when, when we hit those moments. Yeah, I congratulate you for, for taking those days. Like, there are plenty of people out there who are not doing that kind of self-care work. And we're in this for the long haul. Um, it's interesting, right now, in the Jewish faith tradition, we're actually in the period between Passover and Shavuot. Mm -hmm. Passover was our, um, we left Egypt. And then there's a counting period called the Omer, which is, it's 50 days between Passover and Shavuot, which I guess the Christian tradition, that's Pentecost. Mm -hmm. But... For us, it's a semi-morning period. Um, there's a lot of sort of morning rituals that go along with it, morning MOU, right? Not the other kind. Um, and yet we end with this very celebratory uh, holiday, Shavuot, which is when we receive the Torah at Mount Sinai. So we're also, we're kind of in a, an, uh, an anticipatory period that we're moving forward towards something different. So that's also, you know, where the mood is both this sort of tension between mourning and also moving into the future and thinking about like what will come next and mm -hmm. how will our lives under this big change where we get the law, right? We have the law for mm -hmm. us and then, you know, moving forward into the future. Yeah. Uh, Alana, I, yeah, can I just say something, it, Terry? Go ahead, Anila. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, Alana, that description that you just gave of that anticipatory feeling, I think that's exactly how I was feeling before Ramadan, where there's this expect, you know, this something to look forward to, to anticipate, but also kind of feeling down with the pandemic. So it was a kind of like mourning in that way, grieving for the suffering that so many of our sisters and brothers were experiencing with this pandemic. So it was that kind of mourning period, but that anticip anticipation. Uh, so I, I, I like how you described that because I could relate to it. Yeah, and I think there's a that this this Easter season for a lot of Christians has been um, has has included that 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 sort of sense of grief and 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 hopefulness. Uh, there there always is a uh, in the in the season of Easter uh, it, when we do it right um, is a a sense that Pentecost is coming, and we're so we're celebrating uh, the the risen life of Jesus, but then when Pentecost comes, we all have a job to do. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's that's when that's when uh, when followers of Jesus are sort of sort of uh, recognize their empowerment to love their neighbor, mm -hmm. and so it's going to be interesting to see if we can if we can help uh, remind each other not only that that Easter is a time of celebration, but it's a time of anticipation for the way that God's going to live the resurrection through us. Mm -hmm. So s similar kind of uh, of 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 potentialities in our traditions. Um, so, so this is a challenging time and let's maybe spend a few minutes talking about, about this challenging time and what, what's challenging about it. And then what, what do our wisdom traditions like have to offer? Um, what do they offer us uh, in terms of how to respond to these challenging times? Uh, Alana, would you go first? Sure. I mean, Judaism has, all, actually, it's sort of interesting. I was reading um, just a couple of days ago about there was a cholera epidemic in mm -hmm. London in, I think it was 1860, um, mid-19th century. 
And there's a very famous rabbi, Israel Salanter, who is known as the founder of the Musser movement, which is uh, an ethics focused movement. Very interesting story. He, so this, this cholera epidemic comes and he goes to his, it's Yom Kippur. Uh, this incident takes place in Yom Kippur, at Yom Kippur. He goes to the synagogue and people are trying to figure out, it, it, it's just so exactly like what's going on now. He goes to the synagogue and the doctors have, you know, have been telling people, you know, you have to eat. There's all of these things you have to, to do to stay healthy, which, you know, given the medicine of the time, right? And we actually, in our tradition, you have to follow the, what the doctors tell you to do because you are obligated to guard your health. And he goes to the synagogue on Yom Kippur and he brings food and drink and he tells everybody you have to eat and drink and you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to refrain, even though it's Yom Kippur, even though it's the, this huge fast day, it's the most solemn day of the year. We call it Shabbat Shabbaton. It's like the, our Sabbath on steroids, wow. um, you know, big day of repentance. And he stands in front of the, the synagogue and he, um, he makes a blessing over the food and he eats it and drinks and he stays there until everybody else does as well. It was, there was a huge outcry of it, but wow. even for years afterwards, he was just so, he said it was one of the things he was most proud of that he insisted that people take care of themselves and to understand that we have an obligation not only to um, you know to to our our faith as a as a ritual tradition, but also that to really understand that it's to live by that we live by those rules and to carry that through in in the way we understand our traditions. Wow, Anila, what do you think? Yeah, so I, I feel like there are so many different challenges that we are experiencing with this pandemic. Obviously, the people who are directly impacted, uh, affected by COVID-19, the family members uh, who've lost uh, you know, their loved ones or have others who are sick. Uh, we have people who are uh, losing their job, their source of income, who are facing financial hardships, facing the prospect of hunger and homelessness, some for the first time even. Uh, so there's all of that happening. So we are seeing those challenges. Uh, we're also seeing the challenges of of um, uh, something else that's an ugly part of this pandemic that I've been noticing, which is an increase in hate, you know, whether it's been the anti-Asian hate uh, that we've seen, or it's been specifically um, um, Islamophobia uh, online with people spreading rumors about Muslims contributing in some ways, or, you know, fake videos about uh, some way being responsible, play, you know, scapegoating Muslims for coronavirus, or what media has done oftentimes, unintentionally even, is connect Islam and Muslims with this coronavirus in people's minds by putting pictures of mosques or, you know, women in hijab when they talk about this virus, even though they have no relation whatsoever to the story. So we've seen a lot of that happen. And of course, we've seen Zoom bombers show up in different chats and, and conversations and programs uh, and really share anti-Semitic, horrible anti-Semitic or anti-Black uh, racist kind of material, Islamophobic content and anti-Asian, all of that. So those are some of the challenges and ugly aspects of this pandemic. Uh, we at Mass also the Muslim Association of Puget Sound, uh, like mosques and places of worship across the country, also had to make that difficult decision that ties with what uh, Alana was talking about, which is how do you respond to something like this? Do you proceed, continue forward with your normal ritual services, your normal religious practices, or do you make modifications? And we at MAPS actually were one of the first mosques in the country because we were near the epicenter of the pandemic at that time. We had to make the hard decision of do we continue to hold our Friday congregational service when our service has about, you know, up to a thousand people show up, come together in a small space, stand shoulder to shoulder, and we're very lovey-dovey, touchy people, so we want to hug and kiss and shake hands, and, and you can't, you know, stop people from doing that. So do you still want to put people's uh, health and the well-being of the community at risk, especially for the most vulnerable and immunocompromised amongst us? So because of the concern for, uh, you know, the safety of the community and the bigger value of saving lives that exists in our tradition, just like all of the other, you know, uh, uh, great faith traditions. Because of that, uh, we did sort of put the, the value of that over the form, the, you know, the form of the religious practice. So we canceled our Juma services, and then later we entirely closed our mosque as well, based on public health uh, guidance uh, and orders. So those have been challenges too, is how do you keep a community engaged, even though you've made this hard decision of closing off these essential, we consider them essential places of worship, these essential parts of our lives 
lives, how do you still remain engaged and really provide spiritual benefit to people, especially at a time like a pandemic when there may be more despair or challenges or difficulties and people need the kind of spiritual boost? Yeah, you know, I know, I know uh, so many uh, Christian congregations, of course, in Washington State, they're, they're all closed. Mm-hmm. And they're all, they're all trying to do some kind of, of uh, a video worship service. They're also very focused on, <clears throat> on things like, uh, like reaching out to their members with phone calls and, and making sure that folk are, 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 are fi- processing their feelings okay and know that they're not alone. You know, I, I, and I, I think back, you know, to the very first one of these that we did with, uh, with the Imam Kyrie, um, who, who I really appreciated. What he said was that, that, uh, that, that in Islam, uh, that the, 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 the human being is human loving human beings is more important than their religion. Mm-hmm. Yes. And right now, what it means to love human beings is for us to stay physically separated. Yep. And that actually is very similar to what the Episcopal Bishop nationally has said and Lutheran bishops and others is that the way that we can live out love right now. And I, I think back to, to some of the, the, the history of the, the early Christian church, uh, there was Dionysius, uh, who was the Bishop of Alexandria, and also Cyprian of Carthage, you know, who in, in the midst of plagues, um, you know, actually went back, you know, to the city and continued to do work and encouraged early Christians to care for each other and to care for those around them. And there have been historians that have said that, that, the, that, that the early Christians' capacity uh, to, to risk themselves in, in those plague situations um, led in part to the to the increase in Christianity because people mm-hmm. saw that Christians did what they said they would do. Mm-hmm. They actually showed up and loved each other. But this is such an odd time because part of how we show up and love each other is by not showing up. And it's such a strange thing. So and that's and that's why I think, you know, for, for myself, um, thinking about the the Christian scriptures and the Christian tradition emerging you know, within the context of Roman occupied Jewish uh, Jewish religious teachings, is is that there's there's two great commandments love god who created everyone and everything and then to love your neighbor as you love yourself and the second one is like the first Mm -hmm. and and to work for the well-being of your neighbor well that's that changes in different situations that changes dependent on what's happening around us and i think our our traditions have both a deep value but all of our traditions have a lot of capacity to adapt to new situations Absolutely. And I would just say that, you know, in Islam, of course, that same teaching of loving and worshiping God, the one true God and loving your neighbor as yourself exists as well. Uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, specifically said that none of you truly believes until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself or until you love one another. And even said to go and spread salams, peace amongst the people. So there's that same kind of uh, you know, core message that exists there. But I will say that about this point, that during this time, the way we show love is by staying apart and not even showing up into our places of worship. Uh, the, one of the points that I will make there is that you know, we worship God, all of us, we worship God. We don't worship our places of worship, right? Like we worship God and God still is here. God is still alive, obviously, and all around us and with us, no matter if we're inside a mosque or a synagogue or a church or in our homes. Uh, So I think that's uh, a good teaching of this pandemic is how do we bring, you know, maybe what we rely too much on, on our places of worship or our religious leaders, how do we bring some of that spirit, some of that essence into our own homes? And I think that's an important lesson for us during Ramadan, and I think for all of us as people of faith. It's, you know, it's interesting there, it's how similar we all, all of the religions have some version of love your neighbor, you know, as you love yourself, all of these things. And yet some of the, some of our traditions have a lot more emphasis on these communal, um, the communal structures that we have. And I think Islam is like this in the same way Judaism is, that so much of the central part of our liturgical or prayer life really comes from being a a community group. So, you know, it's not simply that we're individuals, but also that we're national or communal um, and that we need to have those, those structures in order to pray. And so there needs to be room for the creativity in this moment. How do you... How do you respond to that? Because, you know, like, while I totally agree with you, Anila, saying that, of course, we worship God wherever we are, there's also a certain aspect to it that 
the community itself is a body. And I think Christianity has this too. The community is a body and yet all of our limbs are scattered at the moment. And it's, you know, we can, we can sort of joke around and say, well, this is kind of a fancy way of saying good fences make good neighbors, um, you know, at this moment. And yet yeah. it is really painful to not be able to, to be with other people. And particularly in these very, you know, intimate moments with each other and with God, where we are in, a, it, it's a communion of intimacy that we have, um, that sort of the, the connections that we have with each other are strengthened through those prayers. And so how do we do this? And Tara, you started out talking about, you know, this Zoom exhaustion or um, adaptation exhaustion. You know, people are finding that even attempting to do these prayers through services online, even where that's possible, it's extremely difficult. We get exhausted more. It's, it's, a, it's a very different modality um, than we're used to in these intimate moments. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, one of the, the first services I did um, was for a small church in, uh, in, in northern Washington state, um, who's in between uh, full-time pastors now. And so I did the first online service. And part of what I said to them is, um, you know, most of you in the church have received communion many, many times a year. I mean, 20, 30, 40 times a year, some of you more. And remember that that reality of our oneness and our connection to God is still real, uh, is still a part of us because the bread and wine become part of our bodies. It is still with you, even if we can only now remember it, right? And so, um, it, so it's it, it is it is odd. And then on on Good Friday there was this long section of readings. And I said, you know, when you get tired of my voice, listen to the voices of memory. Mm. You know, put other people's voices on top of mine when you get tired of mine. But I, I agree that there is something deep within us who, who we need the companionship of other people. Mm. And I think um, in, a, in a country where 50% of people are lonely, um, I think one as one one rabbi said a few weeks ago, Jim, Jim Morrell, he said that this that this pandemic is teaching him at least something of the pain of the chronically lonely. Mm. There is something here that that we can that we can we can bring forward in terms of compassion and empathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just add too to that 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 sense of community is definitely missing, and that's the heartbreak that I mentioned before. Uh, because at least sort of in Islamic tradition, there's certain parts of our service that we can't even do via Zoom, right? That we can't actually like we have these special night prayers for Ramadan uh, that are always one of the favorite parts of Ramadan for practicing Muslims. You show up late at night and you're praying together, shoulder to shoulder. You know, just having that experience, that synchronicity, that harmony, uh, like it's a beautiful and moving and mesmerizing experience that it's an experiential, uh, uh, it's a, something that you experience. You can't just watch it in Zoom. And in fact, uh, the overwhelming majority of scholars say that you can't even follow along if you were watching others do it on Zoom, you know, inside a mosque, if there's like three or four people doing it, you can't even follow along with them in terms of your own prayer. You have to just watch and listen and then go off and do your own prayer alone or with your family members uh, that are in your household. So it's like, we're really missing out on that. And I know for me that every year that I've been going to the mosque, when I hear the night before Ramadan starts, that beginning of the recitation of the Quran with these special prayers, that's how I know Ramadan has started. That's when I get to see uh, friends and others that I never see other times. I only see them in the, you know, the time of Ramadan. It is such a beautiful community gathering uh, and our breaking of the fast every single night. It's coming together in community. It's beautiful and, and really heartwarming and really builds that sense of community that we're definitely missing out on. So I agree wholeheartedly with what both of you are saying about that sense of community that our traditions have that we don't get to benefit from here even through things like Zoom. Yeah, the Jewish community also has a number of prayers like that, which also they can't be said if you don't have 10 adults. And in fact, there are actually services we can't do at all. Like our Sabbath services, if you're in part of the Jewish community that doesn't use electronics on the Sabbath or on holidays, we can't have, we can't even have the service. You have to pray by yourself. And that's not, you know, that's not something that, you know, it's every week. Um, so it'll be interesting to see like, 
how we are able, you know, how long this is going to last, if it's six months or a year or two years, even until we get a vaccine, what we're going to be able to do to maintain those connections. It'll, and maybe that we'll be able, maybe some of our communities can talk to each other and maybe we'll find ways to, to learn from each other about how to do that. Yeah, I think, so as I, as I, you know, been watching the news and Anila, you know, brought up some, some parts of this earlier, I think I, like to to move to thinking about some of the some of the dangers of the time that we're in some of the some of the things that we're kind of concerned as potentialities or realities um, for human beings for human community uh, for our nation for the world uh, during a time of COVID nineteen um, wh what do you all see as some of the, the the challenges or dangers of this time Alana would you start. Gosh, there's so many. Um, I mean, Anila mentioned earlier some of the things that we're already beginning to see, um, particularly blaming minority groups. Some of the, the conspiracy theories out there are just, just mind boggling. Um, anything from targeting Asians because all Asians are Chinese, I guess, um, it, it, you know, as if the disease had a nationality or, um, you know, conspiracy theories about where it's begun and of course, bring, then as soon as you start with conspiracy theories, there's no end to it, you know, Muslims and Jews, and um, then you have people attacking African Americans and essentially, I don't, I don't lynching them in public um, with no consequences because they were afraid of, I, you know, um, and that's, you know, we've been seeing this all along, but I think that being in this crisis moment um, it sort of depresses the, the response time that we have about that. And so we need to also find ways to be able to, to speak out and to act um, to, to protect people. And I'm, it's actually something I'm very concerned about because as we're sheltering in place, right, we're, those of us who are trying to take care of each other by staying home, that means we lose one avenue of addressing some of those, some of those um, things which are happening. And then, of course, on top of that, right, there's this sort of anti-science, um, also conspiracies and, you know, people fighting th what we need to know in order to move past this and keep it from getting worse than it is. And all of, all of these kinds, I, I see it all the time on social media, people who believe that this is, a con that, you know, there's not really a virus or it's not really so bad. And it's really about trying to get this person elected or this person not elected and it's all made up. And, you know, I, I talk to friends who are overseas and they are horrified. They're extremely concerned about what's going on here. And, and they're worried about Americans who are not part of the, the sort of anti-science um, group, but that we won't be able to come back from this. And I, I don't think that's a, an idle worry, um, particularly given that I don't, you know, we don't really know what's going to happen between now and November, um, not in sense of voting, but just, you know, who, who's going to die and where we're going to get affected and, you know, when the virus will taper off and then we'll have another wave of it and how we're going to control that when it comes back. There's just enormous numbers of things okay, to be so, concerned about. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, so what's been occurring to me, you know, uh, a little bit is I, 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 I feel that when, when the communities have a tremendous amount of anxiety, um, that it's easy, you know, for, for leaders to try to create unity uh, or some unity within some portion of the population by scapegoating, by saying that this that this group or that group uh, is the problem, and if we just get rid of them, we're fine. And what we're seeing is is uh, you know Politico reported a while back that the Trump campaign is planning on on focusing on China as as associating China with with the coronavirus in a way that that places blame, and then they're going to link Joe Biden to China, and Trump and Donald Trump is tougher on China. That that's a, a campaign strategy. Well, the, the impact of that came campaign strategy is that many people will reflexively then begin to associate Asian Americans and other groups with the coronavirus in such a way that violence begins. And uh, I read a, a, an article by Robert P. Jones uh, 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 on uh, Sojourners magazine talking about the history of pandemics or plagues 
uh, with violence against minority groups. And I'm, and I'm just desperately concerned uh, that that's where we're headed because there is so much anxiety and the anxiety is in fact made worse by the fact that we don't seem to have a plan nationally. There just doesn't seem to be a plan. And, uh, and so that's, that's one of the biggest ones. And then another one for me is this whole idea running around out there that the market gods, the, the, the economic gods require human sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And that actually our identity as a country is not that we're human beings or, or that we're a constitutional, you know, you know, sort of representative democracy, but, but that in fact, we're just simply an economy. And that, and that older people, people with disabilities, people of color, Native Americans should sacrifice themselves for this, this identity of, of being simply part of an economy. And I just think that that kind of language is just incredibly damaging. It's idolatry. Um, it is idolatry, absolutely. And Anila, how about you? I know I said a lot there. <laughs> no, no, no. You said uh, things that I absolutely agree with. Uh, and I will say that on that point about scapegoating, uh, not only is it scapegoating for the purpose of unifying certain groups, right? Like it's a tool used in that way, but it's also used to distract from where potentially some of the real outrage should be directed towards. Uh, you know, even in the bailouts that we've seen, if you bring in the economic picture, uh, who has gotten most of that funding instead of the people on the ground who actually are in need of it. So you see that being used as a distraction in addition to a unifying factor within groups. And then also, of course, for political gain through elections. And uh, we know that around elections, there are forms of hate that increase specifically around election time because people do and use these kinds of uh, age old tricks uh, in terms of uh, the, the campaign trail. Uh, but we are also seeing that, you know, the result of it, the consequence of it being the hate, the violence even. Uh, so it is, it is heartbreaking. And yeah, the very dehumanizing way uh, in terms of the economic discussion that's happening in a way that devalues human beings. Uh, I mean, I think one of the things that this pandemic has done in a lot of ways is really expose some of the social ills that exist in society. Uh, in really clear ways, because you're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, pre-existing kinds of uh, systems of inequity being reinforced with this pandemic. And some of the people most impacted, you know, who are on the front lines uh, often are people of color or other minority groups uh, and such. So you are seeing those aspects of uh, the pandemic really play out. And I actually think, and maybe this is uh, moving ahead to, uh, to another conversation topic, but really I see it as this is where faith communities can really step up. Like this is the role that I see faith communities uh, as, as playing in situations, in crises, in pandemics like this, stepping up and bringing our faith values, putting it into action, and really bringing a moral voice to the conversation around this instead of allowing the conversation to be, you know, purely about economics, for instance, or purely in a way that, uh, you know, upholds and supports some of the wealthiest while leaving some of the most vulnerable in society uh, to, to sort of uh, fend for themselves while increasing this huge gap between the haves and the have-nots in our in our society. So I really see this as you know again as bad as things may be. This is this is our time. This is a calling on all of us as faith leaders, as faith communities, to step up and really put into action our own faith values. I agree, and I actually think we've seen some of that already um, to a, a, a fantastic effect. Um, not simply local churches and synagogues and mosques who are working with each other in, you know, smaller regional areas, but even on a larger, on a larger platform that, um, you know, it, it's just, it's so wonderful to see, you know, larger like movement groups or dioceses, di diocese, I don't, sorry, whatever the plural of that is, um, you know, making, making statements and saying, look, you, you know, when somebody makes that oh, the elderly need to sacrifice them the sound. And you hear leaders finally taking on um, a moral voice, which I think has really been lacking for a very long time. I, I read an article very recently about the, um, one of the assistants to the Pope who has been making sure that homeless people in Vatican City and in Rome like have food. He took in... Um, this was amazing. Transsexual sex workers who had been trapped in Rome, they couldn't leave, 
and he's making sure that they have food and a place to stay. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, that's really the Catholic church, the top tier of the Catholic church is doing this. That's an amazing thing to see. Yeah. And that's really, I hope where we're all, where we're mm -hmm. all moving towards that direction where we would be able to all do those. Um, and I guess the second piece I would say is that I, I've been very active with an organization, the Four People's Campaign, um, which I'm sure you're both familiar with. And I think that's a lot, that's a lot of where the effort of the Poor People's Campaign is really headed, which is to say, we really need to start having a dialogue in this country that the, the dialogue in this country is so degraded at the moment uh, on a moral level. And that when leaders of faith get together and actually start addressing um, economic inequities and the power of corporations in this country to really corrupt our political process, when we actually start addressing that in a public sphere as faith leaders, that is when we will start to see change. And I definitely say it can't come soon enough. You know, I think this, this is a moment where, where as, as many have written, that we can kind of see uh, the fruit of, of the inequity and the injustices uh, that have been, um, you know, in, in many ways, the policy um, of our national government and our state governments sometimes uh, to, to create such vulnerabilities among people of color because of systemic and institutional racism. And, and now we can just see that, that happening in, in real time. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's horrifying. It's a, it's a horrifying reality. I hope that we have the strength to look at it and to see it for what it is. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, not, it not only is wrong, it makes us more vulnerable as a society to, to issues like a pandemic. It is in everybody's self-interest mm -hmm. to ensure that everyone has access to healthcare, to adequate food and to housing um, and, and to other, uh, and to uh, you know, job opportunities. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I think is so deceiving about the current debate, uh, uh, of course, about COVID-19 is the way in which, um, the way in which the, the issue of health mm -hmm. and the issue of the economy are actually pit, seen as being opposite. Mm. The, the, the reality is that you, you can't have a recovery economically until you have things in place where people feel confident to be able to go to a restaurant or to go to some, you know, some shopping center somewhere and, and get what they need. And so there, there's just so many, there, there, there's so many parts of this conversation that are just sheer distractions, but which a, a moral and ethical lens can help us pierce the distractions and kind of see what's happening. And I, and, and that's, that sort of brings me then to the next piece, which is what are some of the opportunities that, that we see ahead, um, born kind of out of the pain uh, of this pandemic and the, the way it's allowing us to see the way we really are? Yeah, I see a lot of opportunities. Uh, I mean, one aspect is just purely coming up with creative, innovative ways to use technology and really potentially save the planet by not having as many cars out there and people traveling to work and such. Uh, and also just finding better ways to connect with each other across the nation. So I see all of the connectedness through online platforms as one huge source of uh, opportunity. Uh, but then beyond that, I really see this as a, you know, the same way that Ramadan is like a recharge or a re reboot for us uh, Muslims, uh, and um, I'm sure you can say the same thing about uh, different uh, faith practices in, in, your, in both uh, Christianity and Judaism, uh, but like maybe this is that kind of pause on society uh, overall for us to restart in a better way, you know, not just to go back to normal, because as I've said many times, normal was never okay for so many people but instead to create a new normal that is far more equitable, that is far more just, and does really serve all the people and really help lift up each other rather than pitting groups and communities against each other or, you know, only helping uh, certain uh, groups that are, you know, financially well off already and have corporate lobbyists and others uh, to support their interests alone. <clears throat> so I do see that 
we can reshape that. And I see faith, again, faith communities and faith leaders as playing a critical role, of course, with other leaders, politicians, as well as community activists uh, and many individuals and groups as well, but really stepping up and being far more active in the conversation around some of those systemic changes that need to happen and not just doing what we're already very good at doing, which is serving those who are hungry, you know, helping provide uh, uh, direct, direct needs, you know, whether it's housing, whether there's support with uh, any financial issues people may have. Like we're doing that at MAPS. We have been doing that. We're going to continue doing that and providing support to, you know, single women or the elderly or others. We're, faith communities are good at doing that. But I really hope that this is a way for us to reboot and change the conversation entirely and have faith communities play a more active role in systemic change, not just addressing the symptoms of some of the issues that come out of inequities in our society. So I see that as a huge opportunity as well. Yeah, I think I, I would agree with every word you said, and I would add to that oh, two things. Um, one is that crises, particularly this particular kind of crisis, make us vulnerable, but part of the vulnerability is that we're forced to spend time looking at ourselves. And I hope that this is an opportunity for us to be honest, for each of us, for all of us to be honest about the life that we've been living up until now um, both as individuals and as communities and as a nation as well. Um, and of course, you know, we have these sort of big structural inequities as well, but also what is, what is our role within our own communities and how, how we play out those power dynamics within our own communities that then get built up into these larger, um, these larger structures as well. I mean, certainly we all know about, you know, the community where there's the person with the pocketbook and because they, you know, fund all of these programs. They have a lot to say about it. And we're used to thinking in those terms. And this is a moment for us to really break our habits. When we have these sort of interruptions, um, I think it's Naomi Klein. I'm not sure who the author is who wrote a book a number of years ago. I think it was based actually after 9-11, where she's, you know, people you, you had this idea that, oh, in a crisis, people start attacking each other. And sometimes they do. I mean, we see that. But also they don't. Right? They also frequently reach down deep inside themselves and have, are able for a while to make gestures that they would not normally be able to do. And the question is, can we figure out a way to leverage those impulses of gratitude and grace for a longer term? You know, and, and I agree with you, Anila, that faith communities should really play a big role in helping us get there. Because in a certain sense, that will, that's what we want all along okay, so this moment comes along, let's take it and have people become more active and have people be more introspective and figure out, okay, we might have six months or a year to change what we do. Like, you know, the, new, the way to build new habits is to build new habits and leave the old ones behind one day at a time. Here's an opportunity to do that. Yeah. And that's, yeah. and that, go ahead, Anila, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to add one thing real quick to, to what Alana was saying. I, I think that's absolutely true. And I hope we see more of it across different faith traditions or different faith traditions coming together to do that, because that's where I re see real power. Uh, I've actually experienced this myself, where when people of different faith backgrounds come together and speak together, we've had rallies where we've done that. And I remember one rally in particular, and this was about DACA, when we had a group of faith leaders together on stage, uh, and I was looking around, people were crying. And people were crying. I, I was like, what I was saying at the time did not seem particularly emotionally moving. So I'm like, why are people crying? And later I found out talking to some of them that it was because that beautiful image that they saw of people of all different faith backgrounds coming together and standing for a, with a moral voice, a united moral voice on a specific cause that moved them to tears. Even people who don't believe in God, even atheists and agnostics and others, they were moved by that powerful visual. So I hope we see more of that too. Yeah, and so part of what the, 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 for me anyway, and I I I I think this this is true for 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 many Christians. At least I would hope it would be, is that part of the 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 idea of there being a creator, of the creator loving us, um, and and the creator um, calling us to to love the creator and to love our neighbor, means that our identity is not really based on what kind of car we have or if we have a car at all. But, but I think we've gotten pretty focused on what kind of car we have. 
and many other market marketing kind of things. And, and of course, in a moment like this, it doesn't do you much good. You know, there are, there are, there are two things, there are three things that, that, that don't help you when you're at sea, you know, uh, an anchor, a rope and the fear of going down. All of a sudden, the anchor that you bought and the rope that you bought don't really help you. And so we're in a moment now where I think many of us are going to be invited to a deeper appreciation of the identity of being made in the image of God. And, and that we don't necessarily have to have the car. We don't have to live the way we do, the, the way we have been, we've been living. We have the freedom to change because our identity is not based on, on whether we're a Republican or a Democrat or a capitalist or a socialist, our identity is based on something actually deeper than any of that. And I think that's the kind of flexibility that I think faith can lead to. Sadly, though, sometimes, uh, you know, faith can just lead us into being on a team. I'm on the Christian team, you're on the Jewish team, you're on the Muslim, when, when in fact, that's not the deep insight of our traditions anyway. It's, it's having an identity that's deeper than that, that allows us to learn and allows us to change. One last thing, a, 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 a cousin of mine wrote, uh, commented on a post, you know, where I said that I had to learn something in this COVID-19 era where I allowed people in my house without wearing masks, you know, and, and he told me just to calm down um, as, if, as if being part of a faith tradition inoculates me from learning from my mistake. I think, I think part of what it, it does is it allows us to learn from our mistakes and to change because the things that we're changing are not central to who we are. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. We I, all have I just, a, go ahead, go ahead, Anila. I was going to say that, yeah, we all can learn so much and grow and our faith should give us the sort of sense of confidence that we can accept new information and challenge old information and really grow in our in our process of uh, knowing both religious knowledge, but also other forms of knowledge. So absolutely. Yeah, I would think that the hope or the knowledge or the belief that we are more than just the the flesh that we're wrapped in, right, that we're all deep down a spark of the divine would give us the confidence to be able to say, you know, all of these superficial things, they don't, they matter. Absolutely, they matter. It matter, But they matter in the sense that we interact, it's important to feed your neighbor and it's important to make sure your neighbor is healthy, right? But whether I have, a, as you say, a fancy car or even a car at all, or whether, you know, I live in an apartment or if I live out in the sticks or if I'm in an urban area, these are such small things. And faith should give you the opportunity to say, they're small things. These larger things are the central things. And we, want, we all want to be part of that, hopefully. Yeah. You know, so, uh, so Liz here has said on, on the Q&A, you know, that, that faith communities have, have done a good job being, have, have, uh, providing Band-Aids, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and her question really is, how, uh, how, do, how do we suggest uh, that, 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 you know, non-clergy folk uh, do play more of a role in, in advocacy or in, uh, in, in creating some of that systemic change? Yeah, I, I would see it in a couple different ways. Number one, make sure that we're part of the conversation around some of these issues, whether it's healthcare or housing or even taxation. You know, in the city of Seattle right now, they're considering uh, a, a tax on the biggest of big businesses, you know, this, the tax Amazon uh, bill uh, that's being put forward and being active on that and, you know, reaching out to city council members even. A lot of these big decisions get made at a very small local level. So the bigger role we can play in our local government the more of an impact we can have. And if we had more people of faith, people who believe in equity and justice and peace, if we had them more engaged in that process at a local level, even on school boards, for instance, it can have a huge impact. So that would be number one. Uh, number two would be uh, really helping use this opportunity in particular, where so much, like everything is online now. So that also means that a lot of the hate and the different forms of oppression that we talked about before, they've moved online too. And learning how to respond properly to that, because I think people of faith can bring something unique to the conversation because 
people of faith can rely on sort of a, a level of grace uh, or a level of sort of ability to overcome our own egos and emotions in our response to people uh, that might be hard to, at least for me, if I didn't have my faith. You know, I'm able to overcome my own, you know, restrain my anger, uh, overcome my own ego, and even show humility and love, even to the people who are saying really hateful, horrible things online. And I think we need more of that kind of, you know, positive message instead of reinforcing or just attacking and, you know, adding to, to the negativity, the mud, as I like to refer to it, right? We can really you know, pull ourselves out of the mud and bring a better conversation uh, to, to our communities and even in response to a lot of this hate online, if people get trained, and this is why I know, Terry, you and I do our Facts Over Fear campaign and our Faith Over Fear ally training, because it trains people on how to effectively respond to hate and two different forms of conspiracy theories or, you know, all of this hate that we see online, how to do it in an effective way, not in a way that just gets people to further dig in to their own positions. So I think we can take advantage of this opportunity to really get trained in those kinds of skills and then put those skills to use online and also be very active, you know, locally in sort of city politics, school boards, uh, and, and of course at the state level as well, uh, to advocate for some of the, some of the uh, most vulnerable in our communities. Like right now, you know, undocumented immigrants are not part of any relief fund at a federal level. Uh, so being able to uh, advocate for them being covered or being able to advocate for freeing some of the prisoners who are now facing, you know, uh, COVID-19 uh, in prisons and it's really spreading uh, and, and it's not being talked about that much, but raising awareness about that and taking action on those kinds of issues that are not really discussed that often, as well as all the other big issues, whether it's environmental justice, whether it's racism, you know, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, um, you know, healthcare, housing, homelessness, all of these uh, would benefit from stronger, you know, individual faith voices uh, coming into the conversation and being active with them. Those are just some ideas. I have more, but I'll stop there. I would actually only build on that a little bit to say that one of the things that is the most important um, is to expand your network. Uh, and in the sense of both in, in your own faith community, learn to, you know, Talk to those people who you haven't talked to before, maybe because you don't agree with them, and also go outside of your your local community, the places where you already know, and start speaking to people who you don't know. And that's actually part. It's it's actually just a part and parcel of what Anila was saying earlier, in that it gives you an opportunity to respond when you hear something which is. Um, you know, which is not, not good, which is racist or which is uh, anti-Semitic or which is Islamophobic. Um, and it, but you can't respond to somebody until you actually are in their presence, whether that's a virtual presence or a face-to-face -face presence. And in the same, also on your first point in getting more involved in politics in general is be part of a larger group in that sense as well. Um, you know, join with other people who are either virtually or in person someday, again, God willing, um, working on those issues so that you can have a voice. One voice doesn't often move things, but a thousand voices does. And you, you get a thousand voices by having one and one and one and one. So join those groups, join the Poor People's Campaign, um, go to your church and say, we really want trainings from, you know, we have pomegranate initiative here on the East Coast or, and, you know, um, Faith Over Fear on the West Coast, bring people in and, so that your church can come and hear those things as well you have a, a huge opportunity within your community where you're known to bring people in and have people talk, even if it's not you. And of course you yourself have that opportunity to raise your voice as well. You know, when people of faith show up and speak, uh, and speak as respectfully listening to other points of view, um, there is something really powerful about that. Um, number two, that, that I think Christians uh, have a particular role to play in this country because we are, we are, part of a religious majority. And so it's really important for us not only to speak, but also to create space for other voices. Like that is just so incredibly important. Mm -hmm. and, and to listen deeply and to have the humility to listen deeply in those contexts so that people who we're talking with have a chance to be heard in a way they wouldn't otherwise. Um, and, and, and to be public, to be willing to be public and to remember that we don't have to, to have to do this on every issue. Uh, if individuals, members of a congregation, you know, they can choose different topics. Maybe as a community, you have one or two, but you don't have to do this on every single topic. 
you can trust that other people are picking up that, that particular issue and carrying your values forward um, with respect to that issue. And, you know, just so, so we, we do get to po some positivity here or to, to some additional positivity, what are some of the things that, that we see uh, faith communities or wisdom communities doing right now to respond uh, to COVID-19 and the entire crisis that we see? Oh, I have a great one that just yeah. happened. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so at the Muslim Association of Puget Sound, we have a social services and humanitarian program called Muslim Community Resource Center (MCRC), uh, and they've been working. You know, they work. For, they've always been working on serving those in need uh, through food assistance, through you know rental utility assistance, yeah. uh, helping with the elderly, all of that stuff. So they've been doing this all along. But with COVID nineteen, we decided to increase our investment directly in providing humanitarian support and services, relief work uh, for uh, the wider community. And this is something, by the way, MCRC's work has always been for everybody, not just Muslims. Uh, even though most of the funding comes from Muslims, the majority of recipients of the aid are non-Muslims. Uh, but with COVID-19, you know, they've certainly increased and you see the amount of food that they've distributed, the masks, they donated 5,000 masks to local healthcare workers and others on the front line. Uh, they've done, you know, just incredible work with food distribution, rental and utility assistance of over 100,000 dollars that they provided to individuals but some a story that I, that I thought was really compelling was this last week this last week uh, the uh, the LDS Church uh, they uh, th th they had delivered 33,000 pounds of food to maps uh, and those 33,000 pounds of food, uh, it was through a partnership between MAPS MCRC uh, and the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the LDS Church. Uh, so they, they were able to get this food and the MCRC, they added their own food to it. So there was over 35,000 pounds of food that over the weekend volunteers, the majority of whom are Muslim, who are fasting, they were out there packing all of these, you know, 35,000 pounds of food into different boxes and food packages that they then distributed a thousand packages of food to people in need. And they're going to continue delivering more of that food to others. But I thought it was a beautiful example of all of our, you know, the best of our faith practices in action, because it was these two faith communities who both are dedicated to helping those in need coming together, putting their resources together because the LDS church has a warehouse. So they're able to get the food from their warehouse, deliver it to MAPS, have MAPS volunteers, uh, MCRC volunteers put it all together and then make sure it reaches the people in need. I thought it was just so heartwarming for me to see that story. And there's so many examples like that in different faith communities that we're seeing. Alana, how about you? What are you seeing out there? You know, it's amazing. I, I just see there's so much going on at the moment, um, both individual and, you know, communal levels of responsiveness between communities and inside communities. People are, you know, all of a sudden teens are finding out, oh, we have elderly neighbors, let me go get groceries for them. And, you know, synagogues and churches and mosques are, you know, calling everybody in their community and making sure that they're okay, you know, which in theory we should all have been doing before. And yet somehow it didn't happen and now it's happening. And I, I think it's amazing because the moment is actually giving us an opportunity to remember what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and we're doing it. So, some of us are doing it. And I think a lot of us are doing it. And Again, we also, we see these, um, these intra-communal cooperative things. Although I do have to say something that I did find very touching is, so in New York, where there's a large ultra-Orthodox Jewish community, which has been very heavily affected by COVID because they were not, initially they didn't react fast enough to um, the sort of the distancing orders. And there's, I mean, there's all kinds of social, sociological reasons for that, but they did start following them. But now, of course, a lot of them have been sick. Well, about a week ago, the heads of their communities issued a statement saying everybody who has the antibodies should go and donate blood. And so there were pictures in, in the Jewish press in New York of all of these ultra-Orthodox people lining up to donate blood at a safe distance. <laughs> but they were saying thousands, like it was like 30,000. It was some crazy number of people who were going to donate to give the antibodies. And the, I saw the letter that went out and it was interesting. So in the Jewish community, particularly in the ultra, in the Orthodox, conservative ultra Orthodox community, on, this, on Saturday, there's a lot of limitations about what you can do, right? You're, you can't drive, you, you can't use electricity, all these things. So this letter actually said, because um, of the principle of saving a life, you can even, you know, there's a, the, your 
you're, you have permission to go and drive, to go give blood so that antibodies will be available. And people were doing it, which is, I was just very touched and moved by that. It's not, that's not my part of the community, but it's an amazing piece of, you know, when people finally, you know, this is something I can do, they go and do it. You know, I, I've, I've been thinking locally here, you know, we've got some really excellent examples. Um, I know Gethsemane Lutheran Church in Seattle is working with the uh, Seattle Public Utilities and some local businesses to try to address some food insecurity and some low-income housing high-rises. And uh, that's, that's incredible. Uh, St. Luke's Episcopal Church in, in, in Seattle in the Ballard area has a fe feeding program and that they've had for years. And now they're working with the city to kind of be able to feed more people. Trinity Lutheran in Linwood has had for years a thing called Neighbors in Need, where people who are food insecure, maybe even homeless, can kind of come and find some, some food, of course, a basic need, uh, some clothing, some coats. Um, and, and so they've transitioned that, of course, into more of a to-go kind of a thing. They don't get people all inside, but people are finding ways. And, and those are, in some ways, Band-Aids, uh, I, I suppose. But, but it, is, it is extremely important to meet those specific needs, as well as to begin to address some of the institutional and structural issues that obviously are more complex. But, but we've got to get into, I think, the, the depth of those issues um, and allow ourselves to not always be liked by everyone, uh, to get into the complexity of them. That's, that's why next week we're going to have the Faith Action Network join us. Um, uh, Elise and Paul will be joining us to talk about uh, Washington State, our budget, some of the issues that we're, that we're facing, and we're looking forward to talking with them next week. Um, and this, you can find out more about what Paths to Understanding does at pathstounderstanding.org. Remember that Challenge 2.0 is hosted by Jeff Renner. It's on our YouTube channel, and it's on MeTV on Sunday mornings at 7.30 in the morning. And Anila referenced, of course, our Facts Over Fear campaign, a social media campaign trying to counter anti-Muslim bigotry uh, through positive messages and some animated videos. And I just want to thank Alana and Anila for joining me tonight. It was just like a total hoot. I could sit here and go for a long time, but I, but I know it's, it's 11 o'clock uh, back on the East Coast, Alana. So thank you for staying up with us. And, and Anila, uh, a, a blessed Ramadan to you, sister. Thank you, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. And so I just want to tell everybody to be well, be calm, and be really good to your neighbors because uh, it's worth it. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks, Terry. Great seeing you, Anila. Bye, you guys. Thank you.